Hello everyone, today we talk about Islam in the Mediterranean and the general critique of Piran's thesis. Uh, this is a topic we have partially addressed in a video about early medieval cities, right, and, you know, criticizing Piran's thesis that be becomes like today, like shooting on the Red Cross, like in, in the world medieval history, if you you don't know it, maybe, but appearance thesis about the you know the contraction of early medieval trade and commerce, but more broadly that the entire late antique system, in coincidence with the Islamic invasions, is like you know I presume the the most uh, debunked uh, theory of all. Like you don't find in other periods of, for other periods of the Middle Ages, some you know another theory was so broad and so impacting that we mostly remember to say this is what we discovered wasn't like. Um, and this is also a, a topic that I'm sure for to someone will arise a sense of malaise because there are a lot of people that naturally uh, you know, c can't help but deal with history from an ideological point of view in many ways, many different directions. So uh, it's not a matter of you know whether what we have properly researched historically speaking, but what you know they they presume you know but by personal opinion, by arbitrary deliberation it is like so. As you know, Schwerpunkt, we keep aside all of this, right? We we always try to make the point that every historical uh, statement has properly uh, a, a political consequence, and in fact today I, I'm not saying we will try to rehabilitate Piran's thesis, but trying to, to understand why it was formulated, right, what is, you know, to be saved of it, because Piran was one of the greatest medievalists out there, uh, he wrote beautiful things, I remember, you know, the very first exam of medieval history, I, you know, wrote on my own, a work on Piran, it was about the, specifically medieval cities, I think, and it's a red that every medievalist is, you know, uh, warmly invited, or, you know, invited to to read. But naturally, times change and perspectives change. And today, we know a lot of stuff, especially about this early medieval period. That, as all the moments that let's say in history, in which we know less, we try to to make it more. Uh, you know, we try to interpret more ideologically. This is a problem we see also from the ancient world, for pre prehistory, in many ways. The, the less sources there are, the more, in, in theory, it should be easier to understand certain things, even though you say, well, but you know less, so maybe it's not. Well, yes, but there is also less to fantasize on. That is to say, even the, the same low quantity of information is by itself an indicator for certain dynamics, and of course, it's not that what what is shown is is objectively all you need to know. There's a lot of stuff that is probably you can't see, right? You can't say it's concealed, but it, it's simply expression of society that didn't quite uh, let us know because they didn't they didn't care so much in the end for us to know, and that's also a powerful indicator. Naturally, if one actually goes in depth to every single local context, realizes pretty well that mm, the early Middle Ages weren't at all a kind of stagnating or you know dark or mm, idling moment. That this system transitioning from late antiquity to this new revival, starting from especially from the eighth to ninth century, uh, were you know fairly similar to, to both periods compared and that we needed to stress this the existence of a dark hole in the middle right to the dark ages to and to attach a lot of ne negative aspects to it here there is the problem of the uh, of the religious thing right we can't deny that in our world still did the, the debate over religion from every perspective, right, both interreligious, but also if you know, from from an atheistic perspective, brings those ideologies to you know to, to to spoil historical interpretation. So we have to be very careful all the time, from whichever background we we deal with this, to 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 ask ourselves first of all, is this really what I would like to know? If if I really want to know the truth and not the one I presume I already know. Right, because that's uh, you know 
Let me tell you, just also in religious perspective, it's not really, I, I presume, both even a, a theistic teaching tells, because theism is actually extremely careful about, you know, not letting yourself uh, be tricked by easy by interpretations, by superficiality. Many people take dogma as uh, actually a mean to, to feel justified to do that, right? So uh, this is extremely uh, discomforting just from a, from, a, from a mental point of view uh, for me, and I realize it's not specifically attached to what religion or non-religion you, you believe in. It's simply um, a declaration of historical illiteracy and lack of critical skill and autonomous thinking, right? So we don't... We, let's try not to, to, to have preconceptions in this regard. Because, actually, we made videos about, especially the, the, the Saracen age, let's say, it's called in this, uh, the way, Saracen era, right? It's, it's always very meaningful when we think that how much Western civilization, for example, is both at this point in history specifically, because up to a few generations ago, in the very heart of the West, wasn't like that at all. Like, a very few generations ago, uh, the, the Vikings were uh, monstrous barbarians, right? Which was an excess uh, today we we went to the other excess for for either uh, and in both cases for ideological reasons we often lack the, the capacity to stay in a balanced position and it, it, it's naturally uh, normal that you know when there has been an extremistic position that has you know uh, ruled in, in uncontrasted then there is this backlash there is this need to 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 make extremism from the other side then that maybe after a while we we can't have a a, a <laughs> you know, an agreement, a moderate perspective at the same time. And the Viking era is part of the second invasions, so-called second invasions. Even this, I presume it's mostly a continental term, historiographically speaking, I've met it just in my own, you know, in continental historiography. Um, just to say, what is all the peoples we want to include in this count, right? Uh, we, the second invasions include Vikings, Ma Magyars and Saracens, right? But while we speak of a Viking era, we, we rarely speak of like a Magyar era or even more of a Saracen era. Even if, you know, for the Magyars, it's not that they weren't important, but objectively, you know, they 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 caused a mess, especially in the heart of Europe, in, in, the, in the three major Carolingian kingdoms. And they they had an important impact overall in the Balkans and Central Europe, um, even in Eastern Europe, because the, 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 they were really at the heart of a very important dynamic. But they're still like the Magyars, like that they're a specific, also a specifically located uh, people. It's not that they were wandering around. You take the Scandinavians; they objectively they uh, they covered a, a much broader area, broadly man, they're right up to the Caspian Sea, to, to North America. The Magyars, yes, they raided mostly Germany, France, Italy, they right even up to Spain at a certain, a certain point. They even fought against the Byzantine Empire, but mostly they, they, they contained themselves. When you talk about the Saracens, we're talking also in here, you know, you know, correspective to even the, the, the you know, southern correspective of the northern uh, Viking world that historiographically speaking we tend to not even conceive right uh, it's obvious that there were different dynamics and uh, one could say you know what were the Vikings more or less you know historiographically are they more or less important than the Saracens but the, 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 the question is not even posed like that is to say nobody cares because most of the people who care just uh, make it uh, a point of this were the invaders they were not just uh, there is not even a religious discriminant in here, you see, because to the Vikings, um, you know, they were pagans, so technically they were enemies of Christianity in itself, but it's as if the West, at certain, just at certain levels, perceives that Islam as a greater threat, and objectively, at the time, and objectively, we know that the clash between, well, you know, the Scandinavians were Christianized in the end, uh, you know, the struggle between... Christianity and Islam, in spite of the, the overwhelming meeting ground between the two civilizations, actually, you know, remained, right? It was even re-intensified. And actually, as we explained also in the Saracen history videos, uh, most of what we actually think of the Saracen invasions like, it's something that in the West we stylicize historiographically from, from the modern age, from the, the Ottoman Wars, right? You know, we we decided between 
collective memory that had been lost, you know, since the, the 10th, 11th century, when the Saracen Age basically finishes. Um, after half of a millennium, we decided that when we had to tell the story of the Saracens, that was the same history of, of Ottoman uh, pri- privateering during, during the, the early modern age. That, that's fundamentally the story. And we, uh, we attached to the, to the Saracens the, the stereotype of the Turk in the same dynamics in which they said it's not that in part were different of course this was mostly a Mediterranean dimension today we talk specifically about the Mediterranean but there is an aspect that we underestimate of it that is first of all the much greater fragmentation and let's say weak areas politically speaking that are involved in here like when we talk about the Ottoman wars we're talking about you know modern states that are fighting in a you know Europe might have been divided, but, you know, we're talking about, you know, that they had pretty strong capacities. The Ottoman Empire was also a pretty, you know, as you know, advanced thing. Um, so it was a world also in which there was a specific international frame in which to, to, to contextualize this clash, right? It was kind of obvious, right? But the, by Saracen times, the question was very different because as we have seen, um, often seen, first of all, before, uh, essentially, it's even difficult to, to put a, you know, a beginning and an end to Saracen times, because the thing went on, you could say, since the very uh, early Islamic invasions, right? And it ended, as we've seen, up to the 11th century, right? That That's mostly with the, the Italian maritime republics and the Crusades that sweep the, the Mediterranean, mostly... Sa- Saracen Persis still exists, but it's you know it's been dramatically narrowed now. The, the Christians have the upper hand up to the uh, up, up to Ottoman times, right? Where there, there is a balance after all. By Saracen times, there is definitely a, a prevalence of Muslim uh, the Muslim natives in Mediterranean, um, especially in the West, right? In Western Mediterranean, because of course the, the Byzantine Empire that is an exception in many ways in Christian world it's it's a real state we can say it, it it's been dramatically contracted and um resized by the same Islamic Islamic invasions but it's it still has a a, a proper navy a, you know a, a continuity in its institutions it's a pretty bulky power and it goes on counter but as far as the western is concerned there there was not just a muslim prevalence in that sense but a fragmented uh, reality, both from the Christian side and the, uh, the 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 Islamic one, right? And this is true, especially for the Central Mediterranean, in the areas where Saracens hit the most. We're talking chiefly about southern Italy and southern France, and um, the Saracens went, you know, far and wide. Historically speaking, in, in, even in the 14th century, they went to they, they they pillaged Iceland. You know, we have you know this. this dramatic capacity of projection even in contexts that were very different from, from this one that was that capability but from, from one side we have the Caliphate of Cordoba that is encompassing almost all the Iberian Peninsula that is also a proper state like it's properly like the Byzantine Empire like it, is, um, it, it inherited from of course the great Hellenistic uh, Ro- uh, Roman Hellenic tradition the the statal nature of of the caliphate as it was formed for, for would be formed also for the Basids and so on, so that's a state you have a a, a bureaucracy a, a administration a professional army a, you know it, it's a concrete power in, in that sense in 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 the Latin Germanic world you have something very different uh, you have uh, theoretically an empire that is there sometimes around sometimes there is not right um, there are just all these various local princes that on a provincial maximally regional scale contained the, the imperial crown the the broader structures are very slow very rudimentary and they're not centralized and the vassalatic beneficiary system is fundamentally developing in this process and therefore we have an easy target right given the political fragmentation and given especially the wealth of these areas, right, um, the 
the, the Muslims conquer Sicily. They, they establish strongholds all over the southern and even central Italy. And they, they entrench themselves in Fraxinetum, in the south, um, southeast of France, where they will remain for a very long time and becoming this very uh, important wedge in international policy, especially between the Ottonian and uh, the Ottonians and the, the, the Umayyads. There is a, um, you know, Muslim presence in southern France basically ends just by the 11th century, right? It's not even that there is a proper moment in which uh, this thing ends because the same local powers, so this is the first step that, uh, you know, we have to, to, to accept. We're, we're maintaining them there. Like, the southern French powers could prefer quite easily to coexist with the Muslims than to be subdued by northern powers. Um, the the same Saracens in, um, in Peninsular Italy are actually called as mercenaries by the the local Longobard duchies that were fighting against the Byzantines or you know also defending themselves from the north. The, the thing goes out of hand, right? And a pretty messed up situation um, arises. But in, in this whole picture that is marked by fundamentally you know, endemic warfare that you would say, but wait a second, what was happening like in, in the whole rest of Europe, aside from the, the same invasions of the Vikings and Magyars, like a, the same exact thing, right? Um, it's not that the Saracen raids didn't impact structurally these areas, right? They actually triggered quite interesting situations, but what we see is that on the long run, not only the Christians managed to, to actually get the upper hand, as we have seen by the 11th century, but it also, they came out of this struggle overpowered compared to whatever, you know, these powers in early medieval times, even late antique times, had ever, ever conceived to, to be capable of doing, right? We're talking about the Italian city-states, we're talking about also the, the kingdoms of the Reconquista, we're talking that, that precede the Crusades, actually, in this passage, and that they mostly did the thing on their own, right? The Crusades are objectively starting from a moment in which the, the Islamic threat to Europe had ceased um, uh, at large because the you know the, the basically the barbarian monarchs were making it on their own to expand it the, especially the, the Umayyad Caliphate had you know collapsed into the typhus and so on the Seljuks yes they taken this big strike uh, they made this big strike at Manzikert and invading Anatolia and um, and settling there and seizing Jerusalem and so on, but th this were by the seventies, by the nineties when the Crusades are launched, um, they were in cry they, they had been fragmented. They were fr you know they were on the uh, not on the withdrawal, but fundamentally they had lost that push. That so the Crusades are actually yes they are a response to Islamic invasions as some you know. People say, you know, it's not, right? Sometimes uh, this, this, we want to criticize the Crusades, say, yeah, this, this, this were just colonialism in medieval times, those evil Westerners. No, it wasn't like that. And objectively, the religious clash is what was legitimizing the thing, not completely motivating it in the sense that without Gregorian reforms, without how the, the Christianity was changing within itself, there would have been no Crusades. Right, there's as there there have not been in, in the Byzantine Empire, for example. Um so even interpreting the Crusades in that sense is somewhat dangerous and it, it doesn't even take into consideration what happened properly actually during the Saracen year. That is to say, how is that in the south the tides were turned and um and how do you see this massively like, you know, military engineering cultures, think about the, the various uh, you know, naval power uh, of, of the Italian maritime republics, uh, or just even the sheer amount of, you know, resources that were invested in here. I mean, we're talking about properly states now that were forming. Like, and how could this form if the, the Saracens had just been like an atomic bomb, or just a, you know, disruptive um, and, um, you know, f fundamentally uh, sterilizing uh, factor all over the, the Mediterranean coasts, right? And and most of this interpretation that is actually both a complement to the Muslims and to the Christians, right? Because the, as it's mostly historically speaking to uh, under everybody's eyes, you know that these were just powers were in constant conflict with each other and in constant exchange at the same time. 
they were naturally developing and influencing one another, right? Let's leave aside the fact that, you know, maybe someone's brain will explode if I say, as I already said sometimes, that many Saracens were Christians themselves, by the way, uh, both in the Western and in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, what do you think that the fleets that were besieging Constantinople at the end of the 18th century were? They were Muslim sailors, they were all Christians, right? They were coming from Egypt, from Syria, they were all Christians. They hadn't had time to even become Muslim, right? And we know that these realities, especially those port communities, those the main coastal cities that were essentially Christian since many centuries were, were the ones operating that actually taught the Arabs to, to even go at sea, right? Um, what's uh, like, uh, you know, in the Eastern Mediterranean, what's properly Christian or Islamic piracy? They were all blended. The same goes for, for the Western Mediterranean. Um, it's fairly known that Christianity remained in, in those lands uh, even after the, the Islamic conquest, especially in this very in this very initial centuries. As we know, by the way, that the uh, you know the, the the economical impact also of the broader Islamic trade system was at the time if we especially abandon the, the narrowly Western European perspective, meaning narrowly in the sense that it, it's mostly, you know, it's not that Central or Eastern Europe, you know, had a perception, much of a perception of the Saracens. Yes, they, they arrived to pillage across the Alps, in, even into the Rhine Valley at some point, but it was an episodic thing. Uh, and, and we start realizing that, you know, while the Latin Germanic political administrative structures were developing, the Islamic Empire broadly meant, because it went immediately fragmented, by the way, so the Islamic world, let's be more proper in a sense, was objectively the main um, economical system in the world at the time, right? So if you see in parallel all the cities of southern, central uh, Italy that were initially Byzantine principalities that during this phase take very good chance to autonomize themselves from the empire and to transform to city-states growing starting to even mint um, golden uh, the, the taris right the, the golden coins of the of, of the Islamic trade right with and trying to dispatch them for Muslim minted coin. Like it's not that they began to, to take the gold that they, they minted with the same Islamic characters, even if they were Christian powers, because they knew that that money counted, and it counted a lot in the market, and it was very profitable to make it pass from properly um, Muslim-made. The, the point is, uh, there is evidently a lot more to tell about this era, and there is a lot more, especially in terms of the eventual revival in these areas that objectively, let's be honest about it, nobody cares. Right? I, I've, I've uh, you know, been on the YouTube now for a while, been searching for information of this period to, just to check if someone had made something about it. Let's be honest, nobody cares about this. This town is polarized, but not even about, you know, the Mediterranean. Think about the Magyars, Central Europe, the post carolingian kingdoms, the rise of the Ottonians, uh, the concrete history of all the system. Nobody cares. It's all about Viking era, right? And we, you know, the, the same definition of Viking era is, you know, very uh, north-centric in this regard. Um, while there is properly a central, uh, a southern, even an eastern European de reality in here that is, uh, is not to be overlooked, uh, and that was going on in spite also of these waves of, uh, of conquerors and so on. Because even as we have explained, for example, for the, 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 the birth of Russia and so on, yes, the, the Vikings were very important, but, you know, read Todorov or, you know, other you know, updated bibliography, we, we know fairly well that this, that was a, a, a Slavic thing, essentially going on, right? That it's typical the, the arrival of these mercenaries slash pirates were, were hired and to maintain order to, to build some more stabilized power, but the local powers were structurally Slavic and, and rising as such, 
um, there would be a lot to say uh, about this, but it gets all absorbed from the Viking side of the story. I I, I know why, right? I, I don't wonder it anymore, but th the point is, let's study more history, also more Viking history, because the way also Viking history is mostly told is, is disgusting, right? It's so superficial, it's about just a bunch of guys that are dressing up like that because they think the Vikings are cool, saying, oh, look at the ships they had, they were cool, at, and it ends there, like a bit of political, social analysis, reading sagas, uh, getting a bit more in-depth in the relations with the Carolingian powers, with the, 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 the Slavs, the, the Muslims, nobody cares, it's all about, you know, showing off this uh, quite narrowed down, superficially chewed picture, stereotypical, stereotypical picture of the Vikings, and it's not a great uh, service render to the Vikings, in my opinion. Um, this introduction is important because it's it's probably the point we we're making here, and dimensions here are important. Yes, dimensions sometimes do matter, and um, and aside from double. Uh, meanings here uh, in our uh, jokes the the question is always the imperial and universal dimension right now we will not talk about this specifically but it's a it's also a chapter we have to stress and accept it from uh, from the Muslim perspective of the story that is to say we I don't know I presume at least I do it Right, as a Westerner, where I think that of this time, I got without prejudice, instinctively, I always think of, like my, you know, of of Europe, generally speaking, and with 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 the camera focused on it, and then I think yes, there was something else, but I rarely picture it aside from this mostly Central European that they mention, and uh, widening the scale of this, what you realize is that the wall. Afro-Asian Mediterranean world had been uh, had literally changed face in a very short time with the Muslim invasions. Right, the, this Islamic wave tide modified the, this world picture in a way that I think we have scarcely even rationalized our impressions. Like the, the first reaction is say, oh, oh. You know, like these guys went. It, let's let's prepare us to 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 stand the wave. And this is typical. You know, even in the history of cartography, military cartography, you see that the the country that is mostly uh, that has a mostly defensive policy in mind always represent his own country and not the the the, the ones around because wants to 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 see how to stop the enemy that is invading the that is going to invade the country. Expansionistic oriented countries instead draw these beautiful maps where their their country is in the middle, but it has this enormous space of the rest of the world to conquer outside. Well, this is a bit the picture I have in mind, right? When I think of the Crusades, I start looking at Europe once again on a broader scale, including the Mediterranean, North Africa, and the Near East, right? So it's really a matter of perspective sometimes, and personally, never had and never listened to a specific even lesson or whatever about this this perspective and how objectively we have ev even been incorporated in this reality. I mean, think about Spain, right? It's not that Spain from a day to another was, was not Spain anymore because it was invaded by the, the Muslims. There was an enormous continuity and as we've seen before, there were also the same Christian communities that participated to, to the broader uh, Saracen experience. The Jews did as well. Um, we're talking about places you go on vacations to, right? To, to, to the seasides in Mediterranean, southern France, southern Italy. You, you, yeah, you in Greece as well. Think about Crete was conquered by the Muslims, uh, and so on. You, you find this reality and say, "Wait a second, So this was technically there, yes. And and you see this, but this this is Europe basically. So, uh, yeah, it, it just happened for a while, but. Um, you can't even see the relics of that period. You can't see how uh, the the Islamic domination has changed certain aspects of these realities, and even not necessarily for for the wars. Right? We there's been a phase, for example. Um, even this is a hot topic for for some people. Right? There, there's people who say, you know, 
Muslim domination, whichever it was, it was bad. Actually, it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and it doesn't seem to be the case because it's not that dominations usually are particularly different from one another, especially you know, if you talk about the High Middle Ages, right? You can say that certain realities have been historiographically more paraded than others. For example, it turns out that, I don't know, Arab Sicily wasn't this great development, right? It was an important commercial center, especially Palermo would remain also the, the Norman capital afterwards. Um, but as far as we know, yes, aside from this great city, this great trade center in the central Mediterranean, across the east and west, Tunisia, Italy, and so on, it wasn't particularly enormously developed, right? The Caliphate of Cordoba was a greater thing, as we have seen. It was probably a pole of center of power, a very important one. But also in there, the, the, there is debate naturally also on the controllability, right? The Iberian Peninsula has never been easy to, to, to control. Like, mostly the, the, the Umayyads controlled the, the country from which all the other civilizations had done it, right? The, which is southern Spain, which is Andalusia proper, right? The, the Carthaginians had done that, the Romans had done that. Uh, the, they were the most intensely Romanized heirs, right? In the early Middle Ages, all this was happening on the, on the base of the relics of, of the Roman Empire, but also in many ways. We've seen with the same Abbasid, uh, you know, with the same caliphates. Uh, it was either Roman or, or Persian base, uh, in this sense. Uh, but uh, the point even here is that these have been truly a big part of Europe. I mean, today Spain wouldn't be, wouldn't have its own culture objectively if it, it hadn't been for this face that deeply informed it, right? And nobody denies that uh, whichever domination at the time was actually pretty ugly stuff, right? As it's always been and keeps being even today, even if we, if we have improved uh, s certain standards of living uh, in a way. But these were people that basically for, in certain areas, for 700 years, remained under Muslim domination, and you can't imagine a thing like, you know, this was uh, a, a protracted and continuous, uh, unscrupulous, merciless uh, pr prolongation of slavery. It, it, it's, it's not technically history, it's not, by early medieval standards, it wasn't possible even for, for a state, like ask the Byzantines, ask the Umayyads, to, like, say, okay, I come here and just say rule with Iron Fist, whoever disagrees, I, I'll kill him. Nobody had the, the, the capacity, nobody had the power of doing that. Not even modern totalitarianisms actually have it, right? So, the same communities we're talking about here were largely also those that pre-existed and that rendered possible the same Islamic invasions. What do you think Arabia had in terms of, I don't know, manpower potential? Right or what do you think that, it, that the Islamic invasions happened like? Right, that someone, you know, just you know, uh, that there was no soldier everywhere because of the demographic crisis and you know the fact that the Byzantine Empire has exhausted itself, and and these guys, you know, the, the Arabs simply arrived from from the desert and you know found uh, every place without defense and conquered it. It didn't technically happen like that, right? Uh, aside from the fact that gates were literally open to them, I mean, especially if you look at the, the major cities, you know, you know, in Egypt it happened like that, in other areas, because they, they properly wanted to get rid of, of Constantinople, right? And these were Christians, right? So it's not even about this religion, even aside from the fact that, uh, you know, we have today an, an idea of Islam that in the first centuries, of the invasions wasn't even defined as such, right? This thing was a total mess. Islam didn't unify this world, right? It, it managed, and this is what makes you really reflect, to extend like a specific cultural fabric in the ruling class that was essentially Islamic in religion and Arab in, in language, aside from what these people came from, right? Because once again, the Arabs didn't have that manpower. Right, most of the elites we see ruling in the Islamic world were actually, you know, half were Arabized. They weren't properly Arab, um, and also we see the the local communities that were still faring fairly well, by the time, in spite of the crisis, in spite of the contraction late antiquity. But you know that even under in fact the Muslims continued practically to live in the same way they had lived before. That, that is to say, as broader political and social system, they went on. And it's not a surprise, of course, that the major uh, Islamic potentates were actually built over pre-existing realities. 
right? The Abbasids were built essentially over the relics of the Sassanid states in Mesopotamia. It was a centralized area since millennia was one of the most advanced regions in the world. Um, the, 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 the Umayyads first start with Syria. It was also a very important center since antiquity and in Roman times, uh, Hellenistic times, Roman times, and so on. Spain. As we have seen, this great Rom uh, romano iberian at that point also Visigothic, um, Andalusian power, a dramatically fertile, urbanized, uh, populated area, right? Um, rich in precious metals. Uh, Tunisia, in part, was on the relics of Roman Africa. It was one of the most intensely Romanized provinces of the empire. Egypt. The Nile Valley and this uh, millinery culture that continues living there. W what is there in Arabia at this point? Nothing. Well, exactly, right? At least you know in in the Hejaz from which Islam had uh, expanded, because otherwise Southern Arabia was you know fairly advanced, um, you know for for those time standards, uh, remained like a, like a dependency of other these other major powers were built on the. Not on the ruins, but probably on the living societies of, of these other regional centers. Right? So, there would be a lot to say because, of course, um, especially the early Arab invasions are very different from other Muslim invasions of sort. For example, if you talk about the Seljuk invasion of Anatolia, well, that's something that objectively changed a lot in the, even in the local landscape. You know, it, you know the word dams. Uh, a pretty advanced agriculture at the time. You know, the, the Turks bring it back to pastoralism. They, they leave, um, you know, they, they change a lot also in the, the levels of urbanization. As far as the early Islamic invasions are concerned, actually, we don't see this happening. We see, on the contrary, uh, at some levels, even improvement, um, and a con also thanks to this broader connection to, to markets that stretch literally from, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Right, this is the range of uh, the intercontinental range of Islamic trade, right? And this should be, in theory, the darkest period of of humanity, which contractions you know bring to, to the end of people. Just look at their own tiny village, their own reality. There is no evidence of this. We keep seeing um, uh, certain precious stones that came only from certain central certain places in you know in Central Asia like Afghanistan that they used in the West to make the colors for manuscripts that they're kept being used. Someone w went back and forth from there. There was, and we even have evidence of this. I mean, statistically speaking, that speaks for something that kept going on. The all the, the Indian Ocean route, um, the you know this system was actually pretty dynamic. And this is not a matter of saying who took from what lake. You know, it's obvious that this thing, as we've just said, was built on the base of something else, right? But we gotta admit that if this whole thing w became Islamic all of a sudden, and actually remained Islamic, in spite of the permanence, in the meanwhile, of important sects of Christian um, population, very you know, very large minorities. Uh, think about the Coptic Church, Egypt. Uh, you know, you could talk about so many different realities. The, the, the question arises spontaneously: that is, you know, uh, you know, what? Why have we, you know, thought of this just as a destructive system from our own perspective? I mean, what is that differentiated, for example, a Christian of the Near East or North Africa under Muslim domination and a Christian of Europe, uh, given especially the previous Roman? Coinet that had existed at the time. There were important differences, right? But it's not that the Muslims were like, you know, evil, sadistic with, with the Europeans and with, you know, the, 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 the North Africa and the Near East were just, you know, fairly tolerant rulers uh, for no reason. Here we, we think that there is something historiographically going on that we haven't properly addressed, at least in the terms that we are used to today. Also, the concept of tolerance that I just used. Um, and this is where people like to kill each other the most, let's say, is saying things like, you know, ah, uh, the guy who talks about tolerance, he thinks this, this, this powers were tolerant. Um, for the time standards of tolerance, uh, that was, which has nothing to do with today's standards of tolerance, that ancient tolerance in, uh, before 17th century, you know, Western Europe could say, 
um, is something that at the time didn't exist. Um, and we could define tolerance in this period essentially as a balance of communities. But once again here, the, pro the point is the same, right? Here, if there were, you know, uh, Christians, Jews living in Muslim held territory, and just had to pay a tax, and were excluded from, of course, certain activities, but also many of them converted, and not forcibly, by the way, just to enter, to, to make a career in this new world, and um, others were were forced to convert. It's evident here that religion is not the discriminant problem, right? It, it's that, you know, you know, if I need this community here to live because, I don't know, they're good at trade, and I need them, of course I accept them. You know, what do you think all these powers did when they didn't fight? They stayed looking from, you know, from the other side of the Mediterranean and, you know, wanted to kill each other. They traded. They, they let people in. How, how, there was plenty of Muslims in Constantinople. Uh, there was, um, you know, um, there was a normal exchange of powers were recognized by one another that they had this inherent conflictual relations because technically they 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 controlled resources that either the other the either uh, the both of them wanted to to control and possibly also to expand the same territories and that's basically what every single power has tried to do historically speaking. Um, it's even more difficult to see the the religious discriminant here. Uh, in what here is striking is the speed. These are not things you can't say. Well, it took centuries before the change ha occurred. You know, especially in this broader, you know, political social changes. You know, that took a lot of time to to slow. Here we're talking about twenty five years. Right, between the Edge era and the second half of the 7th century, right, the Persian Empire had been cancelled and assimilated. Right, this the Persian Empire was a colossus. Like, it's not that you can say, well, they were exhausted after the war. Right, you can't explain that. It's not that these people had been erased, there wasn't nobody there, that nobody could take a, a, a sword in hand or, you know, and, and, and try to, to attempt the resistance. Or that wherever the Muslims went were capable of imposing their own rule without negotiation. This was an eternal negotiation in whichever reality of the world at the time you lived in, right? There is no absolute conqueror that arrives and decides how things have to go locally. Like, if anything, it's the conqueror that needs the support of the local communities. And that, that's the crucial point. They get it, right? Um, the The... the Sassanid Empire had been, uh, you know, through this transformation, the Persian Empire, let's say better, uh, also in previous centuries, had existed since one millennium, basically, in, uh, in, in the southwest of Asia. And uh, it was one of the greatest connectors, let's say, between the Far East and the Mediterranean. Well, the Muslims arrived to control the system. And they get, by the way, massively influenced from a cultural point of view, right? The the area, as you know, becomes to be proudly Muslim in the sense that in the uh, clashes between the, the the time of the Russian, think about the the Shia, right? Behind this divisions, there is most obviously a local identity that has remained, that is something that if you look at Shiism, it's something that has to do with the neoplatonic of the feudal Aryan society um, against the, the legalistic, uh, Semitic, uh, orthodox reality of the Near East, right? These were separations that went on since millennia, right? The Arabs in this, cha in this sense, they don't change much, and they, they are not even able to even try to put a uniform system in it, right? The Islamic invasions haven't properly unified from a political point of view, good nothing. The thing exploded immediately afterwards. But the, the religious connection remains, and that's where you have to wonder why, right? What's the mechanism that made it acceptable from the local communities? Um, the Byzantine Empire 
the Roman Empire, the, the frontiers of which had been, um, you know, at least the usually neurological one had usually been the eastern and the northeastern ones, that is, the ones that basically faced on uh, the, the Persian um, and Pontic regions, right, that uh, were quite unstable by themselves, like, think about the Bulgars. Now, the Bulgars got assimilated eventually into the, 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 the Slavic and um, in, in Trachulurian background of the, the, the southeastern Balkans, but the question is, oh, also these people came from, from out of nowhere, from, from, from the from the from Central Asia, right? Uh, how was that just in in positive terms, like something we should consider, and you know the Arab invasion something just negative, right? What is that makes it you know in, judgmentally speaking from an historical point of view something you know acceptable, if not an historiographical reading founded on a whichever you know subjective point of view of the story. What do you think that the people that got raided and pillaged and, and their, you know, properties confiscated really thought of the difference of, you know, the new conqueror what it was like, right? Um, and the empire, as you know, we've made videos about this, the Roman Empire was obliged to redefine all his um, territorial policy in a defensive sense, while the maritime power of Islam now obliged it to abandon the African coast, right, because that was Roman, had been Roman all along after the, the reconquest of the um, first half of the 6th century, right, so we're talking for at least one more, actually more than one century it had stayed under Byzantine administration. Uh, and and to basically share with the Muslims a telesocracy that up to that point had never been debated, right? This this is a very important point about the 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 conflictuality that was triggered by this system. It wasn't much about the the closing of a system. On the contrary, you see, if the trade because now we will pass to Piran at some point, uh, if trade had not been important, like these powers would have not struggled to to recover it in the Mediterranean. They would have simply separated each other, would have gone towards different directions. The fact that the, the Byzantine and the Saracen navies for, 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 for centuries kept fighting against each other tells you that those places were pretty damn important for the for the concrete benefit that could derive from its control. Right, so while historiographically we've tended to interpret this from Western side, yeah, we lost control in this, so it was bad, right? But you know, powers come and go. Like, and they, if there is someone that is competing now for controlling the same place, it's because evidently uh, your own control has been broken, but the the profit benefit of of the whole thing stays always there. So the contraction in here that had occurred, as we'll see, since centuries, right, was still not enough, not in nearly enough for, for these civilizations to, to clash against each other, to, to fight over it, to, to get it, right. In the same Constantinople, the metropolis at the center of the empire was basically um, shifted almost to the border of the Islamic frontier after these events, from the side of the Anatolian Peninsula. Constantinople risked to be wiped out. Where did what did the Muslims get their power from? Egypt, from Syria, from Palestine, from from regions that were some of the you know that had been under the Roman Empire since basically seven hundred years. That is to say, you know, there's a region that's been seven hundred years. Yes, it, it doesn't matter. They had millenarian traditions, as we've seen on their own. They they spoke usually a different language. They even believed certain. Uh, I mean, they spoke Greek, but naturally, uh, at the local level, they had different languages um, as well. Um, and they uh, they, however, had remained under the Roman administration seven hundred years, not a couple of hundred years. 
700 years. North Africa, aside from the Vandal parentheses, had been under Roman control basically uh, from 800 years or more. Right? So, almost actually 900 years. Do you know how what, what that means? Do, do you think there is any um, like ideas? You know, those were not really part of our system. When we lost them, they became something else. These were part of our Western world. And these are the same guys that you find in the fleets under Constantinople to, to stor- trying to storm the sea and were, would eventually crash um, and save Constantinople, which, by the way, was a you know the, the one of the early eight uh, eight centuries a dramatically more uncomparably more important event than Poitiers, right? Um, including the Battle of Acroinus that nobody cares very much about was also something comparable actually to Poitiers. Uh, but no, even in there, we don't care because after all, that's another thing. It, it didn't belong to our nar- narrower Western perspective. So we said, okay, it doesn't matter more than much, but that was Western, right, and if, you see what, what here the motivations are more, way more subtle, geographically speaking, than what they see, right, and we're really sons of the 19th century, the more, the more I go on with this, the more I realize we, we actually, most of the things we believe in, it's because of the 19th century, there's no way, other way of putting this, um, so, and I remember the point he was making, but yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the fact that these countries had been for more than half of a millennium under Rome, and now in 25 years were capable, you know, simply prosecuting the advance of these invaders that were just a bunch of, of Bedouins. I mean, let's be honest about this. It, it's irrealistic to presume that uh, this system had, let's say, more than just the force of, of of the early Muslim forces to to be fueled by, right? It, it's it's unacceptable. Um, speaking of the northwest African and and Iberian sector, so these were also as we've seen uh, lands of ancient uh, Latin colonization, right? They were submerged by Islamization as well. And by this point, we have seen it in the video we made about the Umayyads, the invasions. I don't remember the last video we made on the Saracens. There is a um, medieval Islam playlist that deals with that. Um, these weren't properly Arabs anymore. Like, the invasion here is carried out uh, mostly by North Africans led by Arabicized elites. Those who invaded. Spain settled there and would also historically keep pouring in. Think about the the Almoravids, the Almohads uh, later on. We've seen other videos also about the the creation of new strongholds in this. Think about Kairouan, Tunisia, uh, Bukhara. That there are many. Uh, that there is properly the reorganization of these lands on a probably on a strategic base, that is, it's understood that they're functional to be used towards the other side, right, in, in the other direction. And this is not something that normally happens when you conquer a place, like you mostly tend um, to settle there to consolidate the position and to hope to maintain it. This thing for a couple of centuries keeps essentially pressing in the other direction. That is to say, that there were interests, right, at a local level to keep this going on, keep this, the, for this go, to go on, right? Um, talking about centers that began to make a lot of money, right? This was done through piracy, um, slavery, uh, trade, right? They were all the same thing. And on a essentially militarized frontier, right, but a frontier that had been created out of nothing from the Mediterranean was considered since since um, basically 700, 800 year like a, a Roman lake. So, once again, 
How was it possible to arrive to that in such a short time? If there was no other motivation here going on, right? We could speak of the autonomization of, of the Roman provinces, which is actually an important thing. We have seen it very often, mostly we talk about the migration era, the also the third century crisis, this broader uh, scenario in which... Uh, Nobody really uh, saw the, the 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 need to attack each other. You know, we've seen these experiences like the Gallic Empire of Tetricus in the third century, or others. Uh, with the Palmyrene Empire, was a different thing. In a way, it was actually similar. Um, the the idea that the Mediterranean is the middle and who controls it, controls the trade route, is more than a than a good reason to create this frontier now. Now that there is properly not uh, an hegemonic empire, that what basically the, the extension of, of the Roman Empire has reduced itself from the height of its time now to, to one-fourth, extensionally speaking. Someone else in these three other forts, um, one and two, which are respectively separated by the Mediterranean, and here look at the relation right involved as well, is, is actually a pretty good explaining reason why the, oh, the struggle over the Mediterranean route, you know, these systems began to essentially antagonize with each other, to be in competition with each other. So, starting from the 8th century, Islam had succeeded also in this astonishing thing, that is to build a, at that point at least, um, continuous cultural fabric. Right, it was not homogeneous as we've seen. It was crossed by tensions that, as we've seen, put it uh, on, uh, on the way of uh, political and religious fragmentation since the beginning. Actually, it's uh, ways, but it still stretched as a properly, as we've seen, Islamic and Arab, uh, at least for what the elites were concerned, Arab-speaking system that went stretched from Africa to India and kept expanding in these years. Uh, beyond, as we've seen. So, Arab had become, in the process, we can say, the main language of trade and culture in the world. Right? There, there is no other language that, at the time, objectively was used on that scale. Right? Um, this is such an enormous system that, in, in a few centuries, uh, if not one century actually, here has been accepted as the new coin, as the new uh, system of reference. Right? If there was such an opposition in these terms to a system that, by the way, by this point had already fragmented and would never be recomposed from a town of the early maker, you think, you know, these guys would come back locally to wh whichever, you know, system of reference they had before. No. They, they use the new one. And they kept they, they kept using it. This was also reflected by the Arab philosophic scientific literature that had been able to inherit the great Hellenic, Syrian, Egyptian, and Persian traditions and create a new culture, right? Such as Muslim art was the result, with many local variants naturally of an exceptional capacity of synthesis. Right. Um, as you know, Islamic art was, was deeply informed also by the religious views um, of, of Islam itself. And this was also another you know, canon that, albeit not so um, strictly, was managed to be imposed. Uh, Islamic worldwide. Another important aspect, the Arabs were originally nomadic, or semi-nomadic, at least the ones that carried out the, the invasions. Uh, Mecca and Medina are uh, two caravan cities, right? Great for, you know, the Ijaz standard, but fundamentally born out of, you know, on, on this highway that connects the, the Near East to Southern Arabia. What the 
Arabs managed to do at this point in this Islamic culture that is being, you know, after the settlement and was to adapt to sedentarism and to the ways of city life, of urban life, right? Let's stress the fact that uh, the Islamic world mostly expanded exactly on the, in the, on the urban net of not just the Roman Empire, but also, as we've seen, of the Mesopotamia and other, and even beyond. As it's normal, generally speaking, for who wants to control centers of power that are more productive, where's the city there is enough agriculture to support it? So there, is, there are the main resources for creating an empire at that point. And Islamic culture was induced by, by this, uh, especially by the new needs, especially the, the agricultural ones, in fact, to develop uh, an extraordinary ability in the field of hydraulic engineering. Right? The This is important in a time, like, and, and, and in a space, like, mostly, you know, the, the world here, the, the Muslims mostly expanding was today's Maghreb and Mashrek. Right? So these are not, the, the, there are some of the most fertile uh, areas uh, in, in this place, but they think about the Nile Valley or Mesopotamia. But for the rest, it, there are also mostly mountainous areas, often semi arid. The Arabs came from this context themselves and they, they implement in a time that is normally conceived as, in fact, short of uh, demographic resources or agricultural resources, irrigation. That is to say, this was a, a big effort, engineering effort, to produce more resources in that sense. What they also require, as bureaucratic states with an administration, a status form proper, writing material, right? They begin to require writing material, tied naturally also to the religion of, of, uh, of the book, as you know, the knowledge of the Quran was fundamental, right? So this determined. Um, not only the development of papyrus cultivation, which was already a thing, as you know, uh, pretty importantly in the East, especially in Egypt, but also, and most importantly, the introduction of paper that the Arabs famously motivated uh, by the mid-8th century, perhaps after the capture of some uh, paper maker after the Battle of the Talas River uh, from, from China. Right, because that Central Asia was the frontier there. From the other side, to, to where the, the Chinese, they stopped there, but they, they, they begin to be the new, uh, the new connectors. Like the main problem in all this, as you know, was that the, the historically speaking, between Rome and China, is that in the middle, there was Persia, and Persia uh, had always absorbed the. Uh, you know, this main continental, uh, the, the Silk Road mm, tolls fundamentally, and that's what also all the um, antagonism between Rome and Persia was mostly about, right? Now the Arabs basically have everything in this sense. They control the Mediterranean in great part, or, and especially its connections with the East. Uh, they control they control Egypt and the access to the Red Sea. They, they control the Silk Road. Uh, the the Central Asian routes they they control Persia, right? So they have everything. There is no barrier. There is no boundary. Like when the Mongols would do the same, actually, that we do know that intercontinental trade dramatically improved, right? That by the 13th century, even Europe greatly benefited from this. By the 14th century, the Mong Mongol Empire fragments in chunks that do not even communicate properly, more than much with each other. And the thing contracts once again. Right here, the roads are open. Right, as we've seen, even the Islamic Empire fragmented quite quickly. But from a commercial point of view, uh, the homogenization of, of communication of of, uh, of, uh, of of language in this this broader um, world was the Dar al Islam. Like it's a bit like the Societas Christiana from the other side. Right, it's the idea that. Yeah, we are kind of different political entities, but still there is a a commonality in, in between. 
well, keeps this route open. And there is a great intercommunication within this war. Um, so consider that at this point in, in Europe, by the 10th century, papyrus was stopped to be cultivated, and it was all basically, in terms of book written supports, we're talking about parchment from the tanned ship skin, right? Which costs a freaking lot, by the way. Also, in there, there were different, you know, uh, production strategies. It's not that, you know, the, the Europeans were necessarily more backwards than the Arabs, right? If we were actually to see the the ambassades, the, the diplomatic gifts between Charlemagne and Al-Mamun of Baghdad, you know, Al-Mamun sent Charlemagne, uh, you know, uh, uh, a water clock, all, you know, precious, you know, but, uh, silks, uh, pro textiles, other uh, products. Charlemagne, what does what do a Frank say at this time? What does a Frank say? Horses and swords, right? You know that that's uh, a pretty good example of what Carolingian culture was about. And and you understanding here, uh, you know, naturally the differences and the even the accessibility to, to resources. Right, a system like Europe that had objectively been used to remain uh, connected to the broader Eastern trade, uh, in spite of you know the, the, this Persian presence, but still having you know, long-time contacts with China. You know, silk was introduced famously in Western Europe by at the time of Justinian. I mean, for properly the breeding of silk worms to to make silk uh, in in uh, in the West. Um, and imagine all of a sudden this is cut, right? And not only it's cut, but if you want to access those markets, you have necessarily to to accept you now this new presence, this new medium, right? That's also why the Vikings, by the way, uh, this is very importantly connected. I mean, the Vikings were naturally from the other side of Europe in the sense they they open. In many ways, this new route from the Central Asia, the Caspian world, was still frontier also for the Muslims. They also enter in contact with the Muslims in Spain, in uh, later on also in Southern Italy, in all over the Eastern Mediterranean, and beyond. As mercenaries, we have seen it with the Varangian Guard um, of Constantinople and so on. But they properly open an another northern route in this sense that is able to make stuff arriving we know from from China, from Afghanistan. We stuff we find this stuff in Sweden, in Iceland, coming from these countries from those times, that favors them, that favors also this broader um economical uh Viking uh, you know, the Scandinavian expansion from a properly from a trade point of view. Because Central Europe is engulfed at this point, in this new problem. It remains choked, right? And that has also to rely ever more on its own internal system from which, in this time, the Vesalatic beneficiary system is born. And when Europe will reopen to this, to, to out there, will get the, the upper hand again, the trade balance will shift. At this point, its structure, its inner system, it's so pretty damn functional that it's hard, very hard to stop it. It overwhelms everything. It overwhelms the Arabs. It overwhelms, I mean, the Muslims. The even the Byzantine Empire, right, by the 13th century. And and this is how properly why, why it's so dramatically important. Centuries like the 9th to 10th centuries are in European history. Nobody cares a, a freaking damn, right? Especially in continental Europe, in the post-Carolingian kingdoms, that were the ones with the vassalatic beneficiary system was spread and at this point cultivated. These are the same systems that, that start pushing militarily too against the 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 Saracen threat from the within, right? Um, the, the 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 Barian Reconquista is heavily um, uh, drawing from the the Western uh, element, especially the the mounted heavy heavy, heavy cavalry f feudal um, character. Even though actually Iberian warfare has a lot of in terms of of advancements, properly connected similarly with whatever had happened in, in Spain during Muslim times, that is not dramatically documented, but that shows already by the 12th century that this the the Spain had even you know more you know 
it was in part more technologically advanced in terms of military technology, especially than countries like France or Italy. Um, the, as we've seen, Italy in the same way they, uh, you know, they managed in the Italic Kingdom to bring together all these forces with the papacy, even with a with a Byzantine participation, and to crush um, the, the 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 Saracen strongholds on the Garigliano River at the beginning of the 10th century. They, they began to, to to expand once again. The, the city states eventually take the sea and begin to defeat the the Saracen navies. Uh, there is um, a response, right? You know, it's possible that without these stimulus, uh, European growth would have been slower, or that in the future it would have had a less qualitative character if it hadn't been so hardly pressed by this, properly by this crisis. Right? This is particularly important. And in all this, of course, the the systems kept trading. The protagonists, especially the first pushes we have seen in southern Europe, are the ones that fight on, uh, on four against the Muslims, but that are inside their trade circuit. They mint their own, their own same coinage. They they participate to even certain, you know, their expeditions. Actually, um, in the meanwhile, they they call them as merchants. They they have this heavy interaction, right? Um, it's also important to stress your once again, the central Mediterranean, because that's where most of the interesting things and it's dramatically overlooked would happen, right? Because the West, after all, was hegemonized by, by the Umayyads. There wasn't in southern France this dramatic local activity like a proper power, you know, but the central sector, we're talking about Italy and Tunisia, right? That's where some of the most interesting things, fascinating things happen there. Also, when there is the hardest clash, and you know how damn important war is for the development of civilization. This thing changed the, those countries' histories forever and triggered something that had never been seen before. Right? Uh, here we're talking about how many centuries is there from the, from the end of late antiquity in Italy. It's basically from the Gothic War, 535-553, by... By the beginning of the 11th century, so we're talking about 500 years, you have the passage from a relatively stagnating late antiquity to an incredibly dynamic, uh, multi-centered uh, region that is has this enormous potential, incredibly aggressive-minded uh, policy of expansion over the seas, um, all in 500 years. Wait a second, those were the, the years of the of the Dark Ages. Well, it turns out whatever happened here, it wasn't so dark as we think. Where did those oldest resources and capabilities came from? Right? If, if this place is being hit by Saracen raids, would have have to be the poorest ones, the most regressed one, the one had the withdrawn the most. And in some cases it happened, but in most cases it didn't especially in there. So the question is, what the hell happened? Have we really made an effort to study this? And it's not for, uh, you know, um, I know people that have studied this, for example, and um, there is this dramatic problem that even uh, Islamic historiography is not as insightful as most of Eastern historiography is compared to Western one, to whatever happened there, right? So we are dramatically underdocumented about certain areas. Right about southern Italy, for example, during the Islamic period, we know mostly more from Byzantine sources actually than than from from the Muslim ones, because the, there is no, not much of an evidence. The you know the relative fragmentation of powers at the time, you know, historiography was fairly poor in the, in in the Latin Germanic Europe by the time, so it's not that even you know central, you know, the the, the Holy Roman Empire produces so much about what was happening there. Like we have pretty scant information, but this doesn't justify the uh, say, okay, well, it's not important or we don't care, we don't have enough understanding because actually in 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 parallel uh, terms. We know much more about these areas overall than about, I don't know, the same Scandinavia as we were so talking about before, uh, or most even of, uh, you know, they were within the, the, the Western 
stereographical standards of post-colonial nature in Europe that at that point is the most productive in Europe in absolute terms. Maybe Anglo-Saxons were at that point producing something interesting but not as much as continental Europe in that regard, um, quantitatively speaking. So it's a problem of, of concretely understanding what even happened dimensionally, which is not easy. So passing through, passing to Pirene. So you know Pirene just is this great Belgian historian, Henri Pirene, that um, made you know came up with this brilliant idea you know in, in general you know considering also the, the the enormous amount of studies of which did this was based like you know at the time still historians were um leaving encyclopedias in many ways uh he came up with the idea specifically that the rapid that this all this introduction is important for this because he postulated this rapid uh, rise uh, that the rapid rise of the muslim naval power had brought to uh, the break of Mediterranean unity. And here we can agree at some level, which is also debatable. We, we haven't explained this properly, but also now we will. Um, that up to that point, however, and this, is, was, this was his point, uh, even though in you know, more modest ways up to the, because of the demographic and socio-economical cause of the 6th and 7th century, had allowed the maintenance of the uh, of economical structures and cultural homogeneity of all the peoples that faced the Mediterranean. So, according to Pirene, this the, the the Islamic invasion would have determined a withdrawal from the areas of the old western half, right of the Pars Occidentis, of the empire, on themselves, uh, with the worsening of processes of recession that uh, internally were instead also you know already present and um, and that entailed a further advancement of ruralization in other words the characters of what by definition we indicate as the middle ages would have presented by the 7th and the 8th century with the affirmation of the muslim hegemony mediterranean rather than not by the 5th century after the uh, institutional, uh, you know, elimination of the Western Roman Empire. Now, this is a thesis that you can't deal with this. Like, in reality, um, the economical and commercial crisis of the 6th and 7th century that happened um, continued uh, in, in some ways up to the revival of the tent. Right, and it corresponded to a deep and slow process, and due to a series of multiple, you know, of uh, causes that do not allow us to reconnect to the sole effect of the pressure exercised by the Saracen privateering navies. Right, this has not to do with the fact that the the piracy, the Muslim piracy, didn't have an important weight, right? That uh, surely determined, in in some case, uh, to to this, uh, you know, to, to bring to this consequence, and in, in and therefore in the development of a crisis and the effects and socio economical effects as, as well as the mental and cultural ones that ensue. Um, a drastic flexion of the nautical activities, the um, shrinking or even the disappearance of Christian ports and coastal centers, growing impoverishment, contrasts and rarefaction of monetary economy, anxiety and uh, fear, uh, widespread at this point because of this, the, the political instability. This happened, this all happened, we know centers were devastated, were ravaged, um, were, um, you know, raided, uh, also in properly manpower. As you know, uh, Saracen activity contemplated uh, also uh, slavery, uh, like most economies did, actually, on a regular basis at the time. There was a florid 
market of slaves all over the Mediterranean at this point during the, the Saracen their Saracen invasions. This this happened, you know, there was also in, in the Carolingian Empire in the same way, right? You know, all the, the, the central European populations were um, conquered and subdued and, and enslaved, deported. Think about Saxony. Slavery was normal in this sense. Uh, slavery meant also in, in early medieval terms because at this point, as we've seen, that that culture of uh, intensive exploitation in, of the latifundia did, didn't exist quite quite anymore, right? Or at least it existed just in some areas. Um, but you know, I can't even properly think which. Actually, uh, as we've seen in certain in certain regions, in the Muslim part, especially the most fragmented one, it was a fairly uh, egalitarian parcelization of land plots uh, among the conquerors. So. This also, in, in certain cases, brought to the the difficulty of exactly in those areas, um, you know, specifically to 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 create a a more a more stabilized, uh, say, feudal society, because these were all different freemen that were given the land after the conquest and had actually dissolved the pre-existing uh, large estate. Um, there is uh, also a probably there are areas that were more directly pillaged like you know southern France was pretty hard hit southern, Fran uh, southern Italy also pretty hard hit but even in there we have difficulties to, to objectively look at the, the Saracen raid and say okay th this was kind of more frequent Rather right, more disruptive than than others. Of course, the the Saracens you see, as it, sometimes it's believed that the Saracens migrated in mass in these areas. Actually, they didn't. The Saracens had a, a form of colonization it was actually very very similar um, to, to the, the older Phoenician one, right? Starting from the you know the same from Tunisia, from the places where Carthage was, because they weren't demographic uh, colonies. They were they were all or mostly trade ones. So this, from one side, actually didn't impact more than much the local population uh, in terms of injection of new elements, but it, it, it entailed that the, the local place was ravaged, let's say, because it was not functional to the development of colonies on their own. Right, so they they could they they established this fortified uh, emporia fundamentally. They started ra raiding around, remaining uh, throwing aside this major you know uh, local uh, Christian principalities, depending where they were, and or they actually interacted with it. We know easily that uh, you know we were talking about those Byzantine principalities in southern Italy or the various cities of Provence that actually you know were quite condiment with the Saracens at many levels, but we're talking about contexts that were already pretty destabilized on, on their own. And it, it's fascinating because the same Longobard Duchess of Southern Italy actually asked for mercenary uh, armies from, from the Islamic world, which are from, the, from Sicily, that from the Aglabids fundamentally. Um, and then eventually these came to, to realize, a bit like the Vikings basically in some contexts, that they could do a bit whatever they liked because they were stronger. But it was even there never like the possibility, for example, for these powers to conquer the interland, right? It's not that the the Longobard duchies, for example, were ever threatened by Saracen invasion, right? The most, the, you know, they, they could at least become tributaries by by Saracen standards, but there was properly no, you know, no stable entity that could say, okay, now we have enough manpower um, to like swallow uh, an entire chunk now of you know of, of southern europe you know without a permanent base they only managed to do this in spain because spain had as we've seen in the south this overwhelming amount of resources and uh the also the visigothic kingdom fundamentally was pretty messed up towards the end in terms especially of political unit um so they had it easy and in part um the you know even in spain the it's a bit complicated because the the fringes have always been uh, the outer part, especially in Northern Vin, have always been dramatically difficult to control. The Visigoths never succeeded. Uh, the the Arabs basically never succeeded. Uh, in Italy, they met a more fragmented situation, but still paradoxically more responsive one, 
right? There was no way to, to march into the Italian interland like they did with Spain, which is kind of fascinating because actually, you know, uh, the Apennine is extremely tough, but also the, the, the Spanish plateaus are pretty damned hard places to fight. So um, it's a bit different also in terms of population. Um, you know, Italy was way more populated than Spain, for example, um, and more e more evenly um, distributed. So this might have actually had to do with that. Um, also in southern France, they mostly had lordships, avant posts. They didn't quite, um, I don't know, they could populate a, a single s uh, port, let's say, but they didn't quite expand. They didn't have... Mem Part of the reason is also, as we are seeing, the, the nature of Aglabid power, right? Uh, they were essentially just um, uh, a pouring uh, resources out of Tunisia. That's how they conquered Sicily, right? Uh, because Sicily was also very peripheral to the Byzantine Empire that held it before. So in Sicily that was feasible, but as we were saying before, the Aglabids barely controlled like the northwestern part of the island. The rest was like in the hands of this other various Muslim lords that were individually fairly, you know, um, weak but uncontrollable. So, actually, it would be very easy by the mid-11th century for the Normans to conquer Sicily, exactly because, differently from Central Europe, there was no feudal backbone to dare to contrast them, right? Um, and also, the local interland remained very varied, like, it was never, like, uh, the, the people, you know, there were many Christians that remained there, that the, also... Uh, kept their own relations with the Byzantine Empire. Like, you know, there were properly Christian bishops in this context, because Christian monasteries. So, uh, the, the Islamic authorities there, you know, uh, harassed them, but never eliminated them from the men. So, this is all very important, because once again, as we were saying before, we don't really know what happened. But as far as we immediately entered in the peninsular context, we realized that the situation there was very, very different. Um, and mostly politically, you know, countered in, in some ways. You know, th there was no capacity to send uh, more than just an Ammon post here and there to try to ravage in certain valleys, etc., but not more than that. They surely remain a thorn in the side, especially in Fraxinetum in southern France. That was uh, a stronghold that being conquered ex specifically for that reason. They ravaged Piedmont. Um, southern France, uh, as we were saying before, they even arrived in Germany, but they, uh, even in there, it, it's not that they, they properly created um, more than a the pirate nest. Th this is important. Fraxinetum was an important thing, actually. There were specific cities, in, of course, were also under Muslim rule, but they they, they were more fluidly into Muslim rule that, than we think. In fact, as soon as the local policy allowed the destruction of these Allen posts, you know, it happened. Um, even in there we should talk much about the Christian policy, because Fraxinetum, for example, kept existing, because it was backed by the Umayyads, right? And, and the Ottonians at that point were bothered by it, but they had to take into account that if they, they went against Fraxinetum, they would have had to to deal with uh, with, with the, the Mayans in problems also, you know, diplomatic trade terms and so on. So, they had other interests, uh, often aimed against other Christian powers, including, you know, uh, other, uh, aside to Byzantines, but even, you know, bringing down, I don't know, those southern Longobard duchies and all this stuff. So, it's it's very complicated, um, and Piran's thesis is criticizable because it, it didn't take mostly into account the fact that the contra he insisted he was very much like uh, given his work he was very concerned with the commercial side of the story. Um, why? Um, because he considered the fact almost automatically the direct relation between war and the suspension of commerce, right? Which was typical of the great contemporary conflicts. 
right? Way, way, way weaker and intermittent. It was in the pre-modern ones, as is very well known. So the great Belgian historian knew pretty well that, actually, in his own times, uh, just why well, it's it's even more than controversial as a thesis because he knew perfectly well that the seasonal and endemic wars of, of the Middle Ages didn't entail nor in in quality nor in extensions consequences that were, you know, similar to the one of the 20th, right? But we have to consider in this historiography the weight of psychological emotions and structural conditions of the times in which he uh, he was writing and um, was reflecting uh, with evidence on his thesis. Never underestimate these aspects. World War I had a deep psychological traumatic impact in, in the way we, uh, we, we deal with history, generally speaking. But already at the time we knew that this, the end of this trade uh, didn't, didn't technically happen, right? The, um, as we were saying right now, trade never ended in this sort, right? Um, he insisted very much on this. It's as if, you know, up to the, the, the moment before the Islamic invasions, still, you know, pottery in Marseille arrived to uh, Constantinople, and afterwards there wasn't. We know just the fact, archaeologically speaking, this is not true, right? That the contraction had uh, began much earlier than this, that Mediterranean trade had a much lower flux than state since late antiquity compared to before, um, that actually even in, at this point the the connection with sub, b between some realities were f f f far away in some ways went on, right? Sardinia, for example, was in, in amidst the storm had contacts with Constantinople. They were they were uh, feeble in, in in that circumstance. They were they were mostly used to to internal you know ends of self legitimization or just to receive some you know some recognition some uh from the local for local rulers but it um you know it still reasoned and it were as we've seen also in Sicily certain communities that felt that to be still within the Roman Empire even though they were actually under Muslim domination that said that they continued to talk with uh to the Byzantine Empire and were living fairly peacefully in, 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 in this Muslim-held territory. Also, it was the, the absence of a state is very important at the same time. You know, wherever you find the collapse of that, you, you objectively have no, no stability of sort. There is a problem specifically in the... Um, uh, properly in establishing control of certain areas, otherwise they would be ravaged and, you know... Uh, crossed by um by by continuous waves of more years and so on and, and this in many ways you see it even in in central europe with the magyars you see it in northern europe with with the vikings right it, it's a bit the same of story these people came and went and fundamentally the, this the 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 south didn't have didn't didn't happen to work in, in different terms right and on the contrary we see important political realities that survive in this storm um, without particular pressure, sometimes even being by default allied with the Saracens, such as, I don't remember whether Gaeta, I think Gaeta was a principality that um, it was a Byzantine principality, or Christians, but they were regularly allied with the Saracens against the papacy and uh, other um, maritime principalities because it was convenient to them. And they evidently didn't think that, you know, they would have been overrun by the Saracens because objectively there was no way to do it, right? Even the, the Normans, after they had conquered entire, you know, entire Sicily and southern Italy struggled to conquer for, for more than a century, uh, uh, you know, to, to even launch the expedition to, to this other principality of Amalfi back in the day because it was difficult even just to reach. It was logistically, um, you know, dispendious to, 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 even, to even capture so the Aglabates weren't the Umayyads of Spain, and uh, overall there was uh, much more, you know, negotiated room for sending these bands against one another, like it had happened for the Vikings during Carolingian times, than actually caring about the whole thing that that now the 
the Muslim tide was there because now even just the powers are settled, right? It was there was probably not uh, like there were internal changes within the same uh, Islamic world. Think about the rise of the Fatimids from from Tunisia to Egypt by the during the 10th century. Um, but uh, once again, they were it was just like moving the same cards, right? And so Tunisia remained Tunisian in a way, Egypt remained Egypt in a way, so there was the broader connection, but not the uh and you know, the the next wave of, of, of Muslim invasions would overrun everything in, in the process. That was mostly about the beginning and mostly making leverage on the discontent of the, the local populations, pre existing power and uh, you know, mostly finding new uh, new opportunities to um, fundamentally uh, autonomize themselves, and at the same time, of course, suffering uh, a new domination. But hey, you know, these people had been dominated also before. So at that point, you have to ask yourself what was more convenient to them, or if they had an option. But that anyway, the 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 invaders sometimes didn't have much either to cope with this community. And it was immediately understandable whether this these realities were viable in terms of you know assimilation of conquest because some mm, barely did in terms of uh, even just have you seen the same d- divisions uh, between Islam that separated on the base of still of local uh, you know of local differences. Are you saying? Think about the same Umayyad Empire. He's overthrown. Uh, or Caliphate is overthrown by the by the the Abbasids, but lives on in Spain, and uh, the Abbasids take over, you know, Syria and uh, Mesopotamia. So, uh, Pierre's thesis is important because it touches a a, a, a dynamic that objectively is proper of certain regions of Europe without being necessarily connected to to the second invasions either, right? You know, most of the contraction in in of of this mm, of of economy etc. by the seventh century is um, it's a bit difficult actually to to be uh, connected to what was happening in the Mediterranean, like the contraction in I don't know, 7th century, even before the, the, the Viking era. You know, look at uh, Anglo-Saxon England. In continental Europe, one, you know, the, the same years in which the Saracens were there, uh, or that wouldn't even, you know, for gold would know it, the, the, the invasion since the, by at the beginning of the 8th century, right? You know, the, the moment of maximum contraction in, in, in gold is in the previous century. So we're talking about one century early before the, the Muslim invasion. Uh, the same, uh, by the way, the Carolingian Europe also burnt a lot of resources overall, right? If you take, for example, the Longobard Kingdom, which was wiped out by the Carolingians, was a, was conquered, maintained, but, you know, the Carolingian Empire eventually breaks, so uh, this other post carolingian kingdoms have to do on, on their own, and that's where they, they begin to have more difficulties, because, you know, the, 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 the invasion hadn't been much of a, you know, a positive aspect there are lots of things that have jumped in the 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 power, you know the the political and administrative uh praxis you know the the you you realize that there was a, a crisis going on before so uh, the the invasions eventually and and we have never also to to underestimate the fact that Carolingian Europe um and it's colla- I mean the collapse of Carolingian Europe was particularly important to to trigger this movements of invasion. Like if, if the Carolingian Empire had remained compact, but really it's it's very difficult to think that the Viking era would have happened as we know it, or even the Magyars would have you know been so um, um, I don't know how to say that, you know so free in doing whatever that they, they did at that point. Um, or even the Saracens, right? Because even during the t- the tenth century, was the, the possibility to to launch major expeditions just by, for example, by Ot- Ottonian Germany to southern Italy. Just think about 
if this the, the Carolingian Empire had remained in, in its entirety, well, at that point, I don't think the Saracens would have had even the space, the room, the you know, the intention to expand in in that fragmented reality. So, consider also that we think the migration era settled mostly by the time of the the Longobard migration, because we have this mostly Western-centric idea. But take the Balkans or Eastern Europe, right? The in that sense, uh, the thing never stopped. There, there were this constant waves of people that at some point decided to settle in Europe, also because the real Magyars included, for example, because they knew there was a crisis out there, or at least there was a room for, you know, for, for for doing something about that, and eventually began their, you know, their activity as even as raiders and so on, if the surroundings were troubled. So. This is very interesting in perspective because there is also to consider this major inflection, you know, um, expansion that Europe had with Carolingians, and also it, its sudden collapse, as well. That something that the, the surroundings responded to in, in in different ways. You would say, well, but you know, the Islamic invasions of Gaul were at the time of the rise of the Carolingians. Yes, indeed, and that's why, in fact, uh, the situation was still fluid. Uh, at the beginning of the 8th century um, that's also why they had it easy to, to invade the Visigoths and, 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 and to crush them because probably they realized that uh, the, the the situation was permeable, it's not like these guys arrive out of the blue and just crush you know, the, into whatever they, they, they find. They naturally measured the thing that, that there were uh, there was enough time to, to know what's the, the syst- what the system was about to to, to receive information from the other, um, from the outer world, and to plan even the, the continuation of, of these invasions, this is all very important in perspective. Um, the same Arab invasions actually happened because of the exhaustion of the Byzantine and Persian Empire. We, we cannot deny that, right? There is no historical, apparent historical reason for which this mess occurred. Um, so suddenly, right? It's not that you know Islam didn't was was born because of that, but you know it could have easily been stamped had the those empires been more robust, and the the expansion you know came in their mind just because they they saw the thing because they weren't cut out cut out from the rest of the world, right? And uh, it, it seems to me a fairly sensible explanation. And also, it, it's as if these broader southern European areas were, 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 you know, hammered by these waves, but there the was properly never the, the possibility of damaging the structure, especially of post carolingian Europe, right? If you take uh, Gaul or Italy, these were two areas that had had, you know, had been expanding up to that point. At least Gaul was, um, you know, the Franks were on the rise once again. Uh, Italy had had a pretty good administration under the Longobards. Uh, the Visigoths were pretty messed up, and that's possibly why the, the thing was so easy then, and why they took that route. Because otherwise, they could have said, you know what, you know, wh- why passing through, you know, across all, all over North Africa just to attack Spain, right? We we could even presume there was a, you know, an ideal strategy that there was something naturally contingent to it to the conquest of Spain, um, but why not attacking Italy? At that point, there was still the Byzantine presence in the south. By the way, um, it, it took time, right? It took an important time. Uh, Sicily was invaded only from the ninth century, so that makes an important difference from with with, with Spain that was invaded by the uh, the beginning of the eight. So uh, these are. Different temporal differences that are not coincidental. It's not that they were playing cards in the meanwhile, they forgot to expand there, that they knew there was room for doing it and decided accordingly. Um, there would be too much to, to tell. We will talk about the Saracens at some point again, but we have, I think, to enter in, in, in the much healthy mindset to realize that this reality was not so disastrously destructive as we think because otherwise there could have not been any reaction to it right afterwards right if we think here 
for example, in mechanistic terms, just to say, uh, you know, the Arabs expanded because the uh, simply there were no resources in the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire. This is not correct. Like, the Byzantines could easily stop the Muslims even after having been exhausted against Persia. Uh, we know it if you just know the military history of, of, the, uh, of the early Islamic conquests. Um, Edom goes for the support that local uh, polities gave in anti-Byzantine function. So, if this if we just reason by terms of destructiveness, uh, evidently, you, uh, given the, the, the reaction in the 10th and, and 11th century of, of these uh, southern European powers, you have to give that uh, at least these, these raids were not as destructive, right? were not as effective. And there is surely a mix of this, because as we've seen, especially the Aglabids didn't have the same power the Umayyads had, so they couldn't properly overwhelm an entire peninsula like did with it, the, the Imperian one, um, like with, with Italy, it was just in front of it. Equally, uh, the, the Near Eastern powers had, uh, you know, this pretty bulky thing of the Byzantine Empire that that uh, amputated some, some most important heirs. In fact, the same Near East was still uh, capable of a of a massive response as, as still as a functional state that also readdressed its military structure exactly to, um, uh, to to systematize it against invasions. Um, for what concerns the broader uh, contraction of Europe in this point, one cannot exclude the Carolingian expansion and collapse. Uh, there was a thing that went on all by itself uh, and especially not because of Muslim pressure, um, and that is way too big just for the sheer mass uh, amount of, of energies and, and resources involved, which was utterly gigantic, right? Not even comparable with the one of the the, the, the the Saracen invasions, and and that therefore has done the thing already by itself, right? So um, once again mostly the further expansion in, in certain areas was, was due to the partly to, to the same mess the Carolingians had done in certain areas of Europe um, but also uh, by simple problems within the same Christian society that's needed now to find new bases to start from from the local uh, ones and in which it doesn't seem that objectively the second invasions caused um, weren't decisive for, right? This idea of then castellation was born out of this sheer massive invasions. It's not supported archaeologically speaking, because the the main castles that were built were actually not the ones used to block the passes um, of of these invasions. They were episodic and therefore were abandoned shortly afterwards. They were the ones built by the local lords to to properly control the surrounding countryside in a strategic policy against also the, the neighbors and the, the, other, the neighboring communities. And that's a bit the history of the vassalatic beneficial system, the, resi- the rise of chivalry and so on. So it's not that you can't detach them as dynamics, but you should try to understand that it's uh, always more complex than it seems, and, and especially the, contr- the Pierre's thesis the, with the contraction of Mediterranean trade is not supported by evidence. It, it, there is no evidence that the arrival of the Muslims in the Mediterranean actually cut off trade. There is no evidence. If anything, there is the contrary. Because if you look at a war zone, it, it's one thing. If you look at the habitual traffics, once again, you see that even Christian powers were searching for you know entering the, the the Islamic market to make a freaking lot of money as they did and as they were eventually able to get rid of them afterwards right this is particularly important and we find it many other parallelisms historically speaking to this um, they uh, I don't know the, the, I don't want to, to put it far push it so far let's say but um, I don't know it was just it was thinking about Moscow uh, under the Mongol dominion the dominion right you know that was very similar to it in a context that was way less dynamic from a at least from an economical you know especially commercial point of view but the also the fact that we're talking about a sea uh, 
and not of land is quite important in here because the sea, as we we know, is uh, is just to cross and to cross quickly. Uh, uh, land entails you have to control its populace, you have to make it work in a certain way. So this the the Mediterranean helped as a high, highway to propagate certain movements, but also was still um, was a bridge and a wall at the same time. Right, and um, therefore uh, this makes things way more unstable, m way more dynamic at some point than it could be like a land reality where you just take the stronghold and then it takes a freaking boring, a long and expansive campaign for to, to besiege it, to storm it, and it can take one generation, right, um, or more. Um, on the sea, everything is way more fluid. And th there could be parallelisms also with the Viking era. That look at looking at properly the, um, the 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 fact that the the Scandinavians, for example, didn't quite create like a uh, a power out of nothing in itself. You would someone say, well, think about the the Duchy of Normandy, but uh, those were people that were settled, like uh, in fact, like dukes mostly was a minor power after all. Um, you would say, well, but then they conquered England. Yes, but at that point were Western Franks in, in nature. So um, you can't you can't think it like uh, you know a Scandinavian country anymore. Um, uh, the same goes for Rus. Th those were Slavs as we've seen before. So if you look at the end of the the, the, the migration era, you see that there are important cultural influences all over. Uh, excuse me, the the Viking era, important cultural influences from Scandinavia scattered here and there, but what you see is that basically wherever these guys hit, uh, there was a, a local power that rose and had, you know, got rid of them, and Scandinavia remained just within Scandinavia without ha having been widened, if not, you know, maybe in Iceland or, you know, that this, you know, very peripheral uh, areas that uh, didn't also quite count properly in the balance of power in overall. So, it's... In in my opinion, just in the Baltic, maybe you know where they found peoples that were um, objectively even less organized than them. That's yeah, that then where the, the Scandinavians expanded, in fact. But for as far as um, you know, Western Europe was concerned, uh, you know, the, the pre-existing polities basically took over once again. And it's not that they ever like ever, you know, were eclipsed by a. a a Viking rule properly met. There, there were mostly tributes and systems like so. This is interesting because, for example, instead in the south, Islamic powers remained for a long time. You know, think about Spain, uh, but think about North Africa in general, and uh, that's another story, right? And as we've seen, we are um, mostly thinking of a reality that was not altered after this, right? The Until uh, today, because those, those countries are, are Muslim still today. Um, and so I hope that there is enough food for thought in those videos. And because objectively, historiography has still to write a lot about this period. And also, I think, generally speaking, Westerners, because that's also what historiography reflects, has, have to start getting way more interested in this phase of their own history. Because this happened in the West, right? <laughs> so it didn't happen somewhere else. And to, by surpassing the, you know, the ideological stigma of the terrible uh, Islamic invasion, and instead realizing that this was properly a, a moment in which that war took an enormous strength from within itself to, to eventually re-expand it, to push this thing away, uh, way more than it's usually believed, and, and not in a rudimentary, slow, and, um, you know, you know, crippled fashion, let's say, uh, by chance, but properly by a, a major structural systematic event that in, in a few time reversed the tires of trade balance, of, of um, power in misery, and and even paved the road for the Crusades that were just the alt, the alt, not the beginning of this, but the ultimate step of this, right? And this is also perspective that you rarely hear, in my opinion. But anyhow, 
uh, this was just my uh, few cents, let's say. And for now, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.